verse 9. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You may be seated. You're dismissed. I'm, I feel like I'm looking at a few lumps. <laughs> a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. And a little yeast, just a little yeast. I don't know how many of you have ever baked bread before. And uh, once or twice a year we, we, break some un, or we, we bake some unleavened bread back here in the kitchen for communion. And we're going to be doing that very soon. And I'm looking forward to that. But we don't put any yeast in it. We don't put any leavening in it. Because if we did, you would have uh, biscuits instead of unleavened wafers. I'm not going to be preaching about communion tonight. I will be brief in my comments. I know that you're all tired after staying up till 3 o'clock in the morning. So, uh, but I will be brief tonight. But I've, I do believe that the Lord has got something very important to tell his people tonight. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And <laughs> when I gave my, uh, my uh, scriptures to Bradley, Bradley was like, what in the world does that scripture have to do with what you're preaching about? I'll get there. I promise. I'll get there, Bradley. But astute observation of you that uh, it really doesn't have anything to do with uh, the subject matter. But I will relate it. I will bring it back. First Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start our reading at verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at uh, Shoko, which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shoka and Azekah, uh, in mm, Ephes, Damin, okay? And Saul and the uh, men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain and one on the side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose Height was six cubits in a span. He was nine foot nine inches tall. Now, Sam, you're pretty tall, but you're not nine foot nine inches tall. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs and uh, a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing of a shield went before him. The one bearing of a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. And he said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine? And you, servants of Saul, choose you a man for you. And let him come down to me. If I be able to fight, if he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and he kills and I kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight. Send me a man that we may fight. And um, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly afraid. Say with me, greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that uh, Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And the man went among men, or the, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. In other words, uh, Jesse was old. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of these three sons went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the next uh, unto him was Abinadab, Abinadad, Dab, I'm sorry, and the third Shema. And David was the youngest, 
of the three elder in the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul and fed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren Ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren. And carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their, uh, of their thousand, and look how, they, how thy brethren fare. Check out, see how your brothers are doing, and take their pledge. Okay? Uh, take them some food and take them uh, their pledge, uh, but check on them for me. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a, with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to fight and shout, shouted for battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper, in the uh, keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Okay, so we are we're looking at a picture here, to where David was brought in. He was delivering some snacks. To his brothers, his father said, go to where the valley is, to the battle, and deliver this food to your brother, to your brothers, and check on them. See how they are. Don't you know that back home, old Jesse was worried about his boys? I worry about my boys all the time, and they're not in a battle. Uh, skip down to verse 28. It says, uh, and Eliab, he's the eldest brother of David, Heard when he spake unto the men, Eliab's anger was kindled against David because David was like, hey, this guy is out here, this uh, big heathen is out here, and he is tempting the armies of God. He's saying, send me a man, and he's making you guys tremble. And, and so Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, why did you come out here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your naughtiness of your heart, for you are you are come down that you may see the battle. You came down here to just be a spectator. Uh, you came down here to just see what was going on. And David said, "What have I done now? Is there not a cause?" And I ask you that tonight: Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake. They rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Don't be afraid of this Philistine. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, and he a man of war since his youth. Now, David then went into his account of his encounters with the lion and the bear. And he said, you know what, I have, while tending my sheep, I have come in contact with a lion, which I slew, and a bear, which I slew, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be no different. You all know the story. And his brethren, his brother, he came in, you know, when David walked into the camp, he, had, he was a brilliant musician. And I'm sure he was a singer as well. And uh, he, I'm certain that whenever he was tending his sheep, he had been singing, he had been praising God, he had been uh, uh, worshiping God in the song. You know, music's very powerful. Music is a very, very powerful thing. I know that some of you came in here very tired from staying up all night. Some of you came in here uh, happy that your guy won. Some of you came in here mad that your guy didn't. However you came in here, whenever the music started playing, all of that lifted. All of that went away. All of the, the anguish of the day just fades away whenever you start playing the music. So David walks into this camp, and he's, he's just 
Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, you know. And he walks in here, and he, he walks into the camp, and there's this big Philistine down there saying, Send me a man. And every time he says that, you can hear the armor clanking. Not because they're in battle, but because they're shaking. They're trembling. You got these big old Israelite boys. You got Saul, the king, sitting in his tent with his armor clanking. Because he was the tallest one of them all. But Saul wasn't going down against this big Philistine. So he walks in and says, How dare this guy coming into the valley threatening us? We are the army of the living God. And it didn't take long. You see, David hadn't been in the camp. It didn't take long for his eldest brother to say, What are you doing here, punk? Are you trying to get yourself killed? You just came to watch. Now give me my snacks and get out of here. Before you get hurt. And then he went to Saul because he, he kept on repeating, Hey, I can take this guy. I, I killed a lion and a bear. I can take this guy. So they sent him to the king, and Saul said, Hey, you can't do that. This guy is huge. He's a man of war. He's been practicing war his whole life, and you're just a kid. You're just a youth. You can't beat him. For 40 days... The men of Israel, the men of war, had been sitting around discouraging one another. It didn't take long. One guy with a positive attitude walks into the camp. It didn't take no time, and they said, you can't do it either. Ever been around anybody like that? They're like, we can't do it, and neither can you. Well, David was like, well... You know, fellas, I think you're wrong. You've been sitting around here discouraging one another for 40 days. You've been sitting around here, and, and every time that this giant steps into the valley, your armor gets louder. And you get more and more discouraged. How humiliating must it be to be all dressed up? You know, you got your, you got your, your breastplate on. You know, you've, you've got your... your uh, uh, shoes on you've got all you've got your spear you got your sword you got your shield you got your helmet on but you're too afraid to fight how humiliating to sit there as men of war sitting there in your armor refusing to fight They were afraid of the giant, and they were trying to pass their fear along to David. Fear is a very contagious thing. Fear, frustration, and discouragement are all very contagious. And whenever you have fear in your life, whenever you are dominated by fear, discouragement is it's kissing cousin. It's synonymous with fear. So they're sitting here, and, and whenever, what is discouragement? Discouragement causes a lack, it just tear the word apart, discourage. All right, if I want to discourage you, I'm going to try to take your courage. And the first thing whenever, whenever, a uh, uh, young David walked into the camp. That's the first thing they did. He walked in with courage. He hadn't been in the camp listening to this negative stuff all the time. You can't do it. We can't do it. God can't do it. They've been sitting around telling each other this for 40 days. And the giant steps in the valley and says, No, you're right. You can't do it. Send me a man. I'll rip him apart. So... He walks in with courage, and immediately, it wasn't the giant that told him, hey, you can't do it. The giant said, step on out here. I'll feed you to the buzzards. It was his own brother that said, let me take your courage. I want to discourage you. 
Because I am discouraged. I am afraid. So I want to take your courage away so I'll feel better about me. Then went to King Saul, the tallest guy in Israel. And he said, oh, no, 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 no. You can't have courage here. You can't beat him. I can't. If I can't beat him, although I haven't tried. If I can't beat him, how do you think? And I'm a, I, I'm a big guy. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. I'm a big guy, and I'm a man of war myself. But I can't beat him. So what makes you think you can? And David just told him, he said, you know what? I have faith in God. More, I'm paraphrasing. I've got faith in God. I might be a young man. I might not be a man of war. But I know that God has kept me through a war with a lion and a war with a bear. And I know that he can keep me beyond this uncircumcised Philistine. Until David showed up with the snacks, there was no courage. The entire army of the living God had no courage. They were discouraged. They had sat there for 40 days being humiliated, being afraid. So when David showed up, the soldiers were eager to dissuade him from fighting and to discourage him to take away his courage so that they wouldn't feel bad about themselves. And how much worse would it have been? They were thinking, we already feel pretty bad because we're too chicken to go down and fight the giant. They were already feeling bad about themselves because we don't want to go fight the giant. But how much worse are we going to feel when this young man walks down in there and gets just torn to pieces? And we have to sit here and watch it because we can't do anything. And they were right. If you think that you can't do anything, you are 100% right. Fear is a paralytic. I know this for sure. Back a hundred years ago, whenever I was a kid, nobody, everybody left their kids in the car. Okay? It was just a way of life. How many of you remember your parents leaving you in the car? All right, so don't think badly about my parents, okay? Those of you who don't remember that, it was just the way it was. You know, especially here in Mayberry, there was very little crime, you know, or anything like that. But my mom had a standard transmission car. And, uh, well, no, I don't think it was standard. Anyway, it was, it was somehow or another. I was in the car by myself while she was inside the Benton Courier. And at that point, time the street had a little bit of a slope to it and so I was being a Whitley very energetic and somehow or another I don't know how but the car got out of park and into neutral and started rolling down the street and and automatically I thought man and it was heading into traffic automatically I thought if I let this car go into traffic I'm going to be in big trouble so being the logical minded young man that I was I jumped out of the car and if you've ever seen cars and then I thought I'm going to get behind this car and stop it from rolling into traffic because if I wreck my mom's car I'm in big trouble so I run around the back of this big old car you ever seen a car from the 70s they're like 25 feet long weigh three tons you know And so this car is rolling backwards. I'm this little kid. I run behind the car and and start trying to push on the car. And as I do, the car rolls over me. And it didn't really hurt me. But I remember it it rolled over my legs about right here. And I remember watching the first wheel, the first tire go over and boom, boom, boom over my legs. And I wanted so badly to move out of the way. But I was literally paralyzed with fear. I was so afraid because as a little kid, you think if you get ran over by a car, you're just dead meat. I thought I was going to die. You know, I thought 
But I was so paralyzed with fear, I couldn't move. So I know what being paralyzed by literally not being able to move. I couldn't move my pinky. I was sitting here. I was perfectly able to climb out from under that car. But I sat there and watched the other tire roll right over me. And that's what fear will do for you. It'll get you run over. So these men were sitting there paralyzed in their fear. Have you ever been there? No matter what type of fear that you have in your life, it is a paralytic. It will paralyze you. We used to give uh, uh, medications to people doing certain procedures while they were somewhat conscious. And whenever you push a paralytic into someone's body, they can see and hear everything that's going on, but they can't move a muscle. And that's fear is that paralytic. Whenever it enters into your life, you can't move a muscle. And the army of Israel, the whole army had been daily giving each other injections of this paralytic called fear. And they were sitting there. The only motion they could make is every time he says, send me a man, clank, 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 clank. That was the only motion they could make. I, I can visualize that. I got a pretty colorful imagination. But so when David showed up, the only courage there was entered into the camp. The army had zero courage. And they wanted to take his courage from him by discouraging him. Well, they were thinking this guy's going to get himself killed, but okay. Saul said, Send him to me. He gave him, he put his big old helmet on him, put his big old armor on him, and I'm sure David was like, I cannot move in this stuff. So they. He said, I can't use this. Give me my stick. And I'm going to just, just give me my staff. That's what I'm used to. That's what I'm used to using. Whenever I fought the lion or the bear, I used my staff. And he went and picked up five smooth stones. And he put them in his little, in his little bag. Now, and I'm gonna, we're going to read here in just a minute. 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 51, we're going to pick it up at 51. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the... Or actually, he, he, you know the story. He got the five smooth stones. He walked into the valley. The, the, the uh, uh, giant told him, I'm going to feed you to the birds. He told him, I'm going to cut your head off. He said, tell you what, you might feed me the birds. You're not going to feed me the birds because you come to me with a sword and a, and a spear. I come to you in the name of the Lord. And so he, we actually used to have one of those whenever I was a kid. Very difficult to master. But, and that smooth stone hit Goliath. And you know, you know the story. First Samuel chapter 17, I'm going to start there at 51. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof. He drew his own sword and slew him and cut his head off. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, what did they do? They fled. Okay? We're going to read on. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until they come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shuriam. Even unto Gath. They chased them all the way home into Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines and they spoiled their tents. They got all their stuff. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem and he put his armor in his tent. After the giant was dead, suddenly everybody had courage. After this young man stepped into the valley, all these men who had no courage, they were sitting there shivering. 
in, in one moment, whenever David climbed up on this behemoth and he drew Goliath's sword and he cut his head off and he lifted that, I can just see it in my mind's eye. I'll guarantee you, he took that head and he lifted that head to all the armies of Israel and the Israeli army was like, Did you see that? Did you see what David just did? Did you see what courage can do? Woo! I can feel that courage. All this fear that has been binding me for 40 days as I've been threatened day and night. I've been threatened. I've been humiliated for 40 days. But one man, one young man with a little bit of courage steps into the battle. And suddenly, everybody has courage. Suddenly, they slew them by the roads. They chased them all the way back home. You see, courage is also contagious. Amen? As a little bit of leaven leaveneth the whole loaf, a little bit of courage can change the whole battle. Just a little bit of courage. One small young man with a little bit of courage walks in and it changes the whole history of Israel. He, one young man, by having courage, he did not discourage his army. Dis means take away. He encouraged his army which means to endue with courage, endow with courage. So the actions of one courageous young man encouraged the whole army. And when, the, when they saw David, you know, I, I want to tell you something. When God allows you, and this is a big point in what I'm saying, and, I, and I'm almost done, I'm not very long tonight. But when God allows you a victory, okay, Whenever you over, hey, we all have our own giants, okay? I've got mine, you've got yours. Everybody has their giant. Everybody, and it doesn't matter whether it is something, whether you were abused as a child, that may be your giant. Whether you have a problem with drugs or alcohol, that may be your giant. Whether you are in the middle of a divorce or you're having marital problems, that may be your giant. Sin, perversion, that may be your giant. Whatever it is, whatever it is, whenever God allows, whenever you step up to the plate and you say, I'm going to defeat this giant, and you do defeat that giant, keep the trophy. Keep the trophy. Take the trophy home. Take it to everybody you know and show it to them. Amen? I know those of you, and I've been involved in in addiction ministry for a long time now. And I know that once you get over it, once you come out of it, and I'm speaking to a lot of people that I'm just, I'm just using addiction as an example. I know a lot of you that have, that have overcome, that have slain that giant in your life. But a lot of you don't want to talk about it. I just want to put that in the past. I, you know, I just, just want to keep that private. I don't want people to know that I used to be that way. I, I don't want people to know that, that you know, I, I had to go to jail because of this. I don't want people to know that I lost everything. I don't want people to know all the bad stuff that I did because I had a craving for this poison. But after you overcome it, <laughs> tell your story. Show that head to everybody you know. Walk into those rehabs and say, look what the Lord has done. Don't hide it under a bushel. Acts chapter 3. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up to, together unto the, into the temple... At the hour of prayer being the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, when he, that was called beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. You ever felt lame? You probably think your preacher sounds lame, but... Man, tough crowd. Who seeing Peter and John about 
go into the temple, ask alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. And Peter said, Silver and gold, I don't have any. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand, by the right hand, and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And then the lame man said, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. I've been ashamed to sit here all this time. Blame. You know, I had no choice, but I really appreciate it. I'm out of here. No, sir, he said he went jumping and leaping into the temple. And he was telling everybody he knew. And people were looking on, saying, was this guy the one that was lame? We recognize him. Whenever God heals your body. I know y'all have heard about my knee till you're sick of it. I'm going to keep telling you because I overcame that giant. God gave me the strength to overcome that giant, and I'm never going to quit telling people about it. Everybody that ever comes to me that says, I've got a sickness in my body, I'm going to tell them about that knee. Because it is a miracle. Everybody who has a problem with depression, cry out for joy. After God allows you to overcome that giant, cry out for joy. Don't say, man, I'm ashamed that I wasted all those years feeling blue. Take your trophy and show it to everybody. Don't hide it under a bushel. God allowed you to overcome that giant, not only for you, but for the army of the Lord. Not only for you, there's, there are people depending on you to tell them that you can make it. I go to rehabs pretty often. And the, a lot of those men in those rehabs, they've never seen anybody make it out. They've never seen anybody go clean. They've never, they've never seen anybody's life put completely back together. But a lot of you have experienced that. Show it to them. So, the title of my lesson tonight, please put it up there. It's Why Five Stones. When David stepped into the valley with the giant, Scripture says that he knelt down and he got five smooth stones. He was expecting quite a rock fight. So why five? Did he not have faith in God that one would do the trick? No, what it was is he had so much faith in God. You have to understand that there were four relatives of Goliath from Gath that were also giants. There were four other giants in the army of the Philistines. The enemy was full of giants. He brought enough ammo for them all. I truly believe that he thought whenever I step into this valley and I slay this giant that his brothers might come after me. So I'm getting four for them. That's the Whitley version anyway. Please stand with me. Those four giants did all die. But David didn't kill them. After David killed that one giant, his mighty men and some of his relatives went on a giant killing rampage. Abishai, Sibachai, Elanon, they killed men like Ishbedenob, which was a giant. Saph, which was a direct descendant of the Anakim. Another man named Goliath was killed by Elanon. And there was another giant that was unnamed that were slain by David's mighty men. David didn't have to do it because whenever he encouraged the army 
whenever he showed them what could be done with the, with the faith in God. I'd like to ask the musicians to come and to sing that same song. Are they gone? They're upstairs? Never mind. I'll allow Crystal just to sing whatever she's going to sing, but after seeing what David could do, by the grace of God, it encouraged the whole army and they killed all the giants. I want to ask you to do something. If God's ever allowed, if he's ever allowed you to overcome something in your life, don't keep it private. Share it. Share your courage. Share your victory. Raise the head of the giant that came to kill you. Revelations chapter 12. And I'm done. Revelations chapter 12 and verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You've got to understand these angels that were cast out with him. They were, whenever there were giants in the land, these angels were their father. These demons were their fathers and their forefathers. They were demonic by nature. And I, so you think, my goodness, these, these dark angels, these spirits, these demonic spirits are in the same place we are. They inhabit the same planet that we do. The devil and his angels were cast out. I often wonder, God, why didn't you cast them somewhere else? But his ways are higher than my ways. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, the chosen one. For, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved their lives not, or they loved not their lives unto death. They were not afraid. Who is he talking about? This hasn't happened yet. We are not afraid. Somebody's got to have enough courage. Somebody's got to have enough courage to step out and say, whenever that giant in your life says, send me a man, you say, I'm that man. I'm ready to face this challenge. I'm ready to overcome that giant. And after I overcome that giant, I'm going to take my trophy home to show my friends. David never faltered in his life until he quit fighting. When he quit fighting, he immediately began to falter in his life. Made a lot of mistakes after he quit fighting. Never quit fighting. I see that same courage that David must have had. I see that in the eyes of all of these ladies who have suffered so great a loss in the year 2020 and yet are willing to I mean we've all suffered but some of us have suffered a great deal in 2020 some of us have had a lot of fear in 2020 some of us have suffered a lot of loss in our family in 2020 but whenever I see these ladies that have lost their husbands and have lost their fathers and have lost their relatives step out in the aisle and walk down and lead the army of Israel into battle Woo! I see a great deal of courage. 
whenever I see Mitzi or Dana O'Conn step down here and lead us into battle, into spiritual warfare, it does something for me. It encourages me. It fills me with that same courage, and I'm ready to go, let's move into battle. If we have courage, we'll chase those enemies all the way back to hell. I just, not very long ago, I just left Jim Akers' house. And his dear wife is laying in her deathbed, fading minute by minute. He said to me, I'm so excited about what God is doing. And I'm so excited about what God is about to do. I walk in to encourage him. And he encourages me. Let's worship the Lord tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Set our chin like a flint against the enemy. I pray, Lord God, that you would that you would grant us the courage to lead us into battle. Hallelujah. We have giants that we need to slay. We have giants that we need to overcome. But by your grace and by your power, we know that we can overcome them. But not only that, give us the courage to share our trophy with others. Give us the courage to pull that old addiction out and say, look what I used to be. Look what I have overcome. For us to pull that old habit of perversion out of out and say, look, young man, look what I overcame. I'm with Brother Jim. I'm excited about what God is doing. In this year, 2020, when everything seems to be going wrong, when everything is just hit the fan, I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm not excited about what God is about to do. I'm excited about what God is doing right now and in our midst. Amen? But if you have a giant in your life, you're not alone. There's a whole army just ready to join in behind you as soon as you declare war. As soon as you declare war, that's the la- that may be the last giant you ever have to slay because your brothers and sisters are going to be slaying them all around you. <laughs> If you encourage them, if you encourage them, whenever the army of God is encouraged, there is nothing that we can't do. Hallelujah. We will overcome him by the word of our testimony. Let's worship him right now as we sing. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Lift up your voice and sing for joy.
You know, the Lord never said, the scripture never says that we won't have to face some things in this life. Matter of fact, it most certainly says we're going to have to endure some things. But I have read all the way to the back of this big book. And I've got really, really good news. That old, that old serpent, that old dragon, the devil and Lucifer that seems so big and so bad. He's got all these, all these uh, uh, dark spirits with him. He's got all these giants around him. If you read all the way back to the book, to the end of the book, we win. And we win by the word of our testimony. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you on Sunday. And uh, let's go out into this troubled world and let's be victorious. Amen.